Okay, great. Welcome everybody to March Astronomy on Tap. We're really excited to have you all here. Today we have a visiting speaker, Rachel Clays, who is currently a grad student at the University of Oregon in the Department of Physics. She studies the intersection of nanoscale materials and quantum light. And outside of the lab, she works on improving accessibility of physics and physics education. So I know we had a pretty gloomy couple of days this week with the rain and storms and everything, but today we're gonna hear about light and hopefully that'll bring us some more light uh, this week. So without further ado, welcome Rachel. I love that. Thank you, Cassidy. Um, yeah, as Cassidy mentioned, I will be uh, talking about light. Um, light is probably my favorite thing, um, you know, not just because it helps us see, um, but I'm coming from, uh, from the side of when I was a first year uh, potential physics major, uh, learning about light was one of those things um, where everything just kind of came together. So other, the other physicists or astronomers out there might know the moment I'm talking about and I don't want to give any spoilers, um, but physics education can be a little disjointed and not seem applicable. And then there's just like one lesson where everything comes together and then there was light. Um, so I hope that I can either enlighten you all a little bit, uh, pun totally intended, um, or at least you can learn uh, something new about light or how we use light or how light can be used in the future. Uh, so as I've been saying the word light, um, you've probably been imagining a certain thing and you know, Cassidy mentioned the, the sunlight, uh, but I want you to take a second and just think about the first thing uh, that you visualize when you hear the word light. Um, and so as I mentioned, that's probably sunlight or, or lamps, uh, just a warm glowing ball. Uh, but this isn't the only thing I'm going to be talking about. And this might also not be the only thing that you imagine. So some of you might have gotten a little creative or might know a little bit more about light and thought about uh, what we call invisible light. Um, there are some really cool cameras at uh, like science centers and science museums uh, that, that use the, this IR light or infrared light to help uh, you see kind of a heat map of your body. So that's a type of invisible light. Another type of invisible light that can help us visualize things or take pictures of our body uh, are x-rays. So this is something that a lot of people have also probably experienced and you might have envisioned this as like an alternative form of light. Uh, another one of those things that helps us take pictures and sees things. Um, but another thing that is also light, and this might be a controversial take, um, and that I doubt any of you thought of, um, but radio, radio is also light. Um, so I'll get into that a little bit. Um, but there's also another word or another phrase that I'll be talking about a lot during this talk, uh, and that's electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so again, I want you to think for a second about what you visualize when, when you hear that, that phrase. Um, and radiation probably elicits a bit of a stronger response than the word light. Um, as I said, light is kind of warm, glowing ball of energy uh, and radiation is boo, scary, stay away, uh, caution, you know, for, for good reason. Um, you know, radiation is like a byproduct of, of like nuclear reactions and uh, you know, the caution ex sign exists for a reason, um, but electromagnetic radiation is more than just that. Uh, and there's a reason why I'm talking about light and electromagnetic radiation at the same time. Uh, this, uh, this reaction from the word or the phrase electromagnetic radiation has also been leading people to put uh, their Wi-Fi uh, routers into these metal boxes to block the, the signals um, because it's been going a lot around a lot recently that Wi-Fi, 5G, 4G, uh, they use electromagnetic frequencies and electromagnetic radiation to, to send our information out. Uh, and and we, should, we should protect ourselves from it because it's radiation and radiation is scary. Uh, so there's been the, these boxes that are marketed that, that will cut off those signals a little bit. Um, and uh, so building off of that, uh, cell phones are kind of this great microcosm of electromagnetic radiation. So to think about the different types of of electromagnetic radiation. And right now I'm going to, to switch around. Light and electromagnetic radiation are the same thing. So I'm gonna start using those words interchangeably. So one of the ways that cell phones use or emit light, uh, the, the blue light from, from your screens, uh, that's a common thing that's been talked about recently. 
Uh, that's the, the most abundant light that, that comes from the, the light screens that we look at or for, from our computers as well. We've got flashlights on the back so that that white light that you may have originally been visualizing, it also takes in light. So it takes pictures of things, uh, visible light all around us. But you can also get attachments now to take uh, infrared pictures. And then also that, that invisible light I was talking about um, or that electromagnetic radiation that you might have heard um, more likely referred to like it, when talking about like Wi-Fi signals or uh, Bluetooth signals. Um, but again, these are all made up of the same thing and the cell phones use all of these in, in different ways. So throughout this talk, I'll go through a few of those a little bit more and we can learn about how we use those. So the one thing actually in a cell phone uh, that, that is <laughs> really light or doesn't really use light is that that micro uh, processing chip or the little circuit uh, and that uses you know, traditional electricity, electrons um, passing through information. But what if I told you that that could actually be light in the future too? Uh, so this is a picture of a, a light circuit or a photonic circuit. Um, and so this is one of actually the applications of my current research that I hope I can get to, to, talking, to, uh, to talking about a little bit. Um, but this is one of the ways that light can help us advance uh, technology as well. Uh, so I hope that I can talk to you about the, the ways that we currently use light and the ways that we can use light in the future. So as I mentioned, light is just the, the colloquial term that we use to talk about electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so I'm gonna dig into what electromagnetic radiation is, what that electromagnetic piece is, what that radiation piece is, um, and what that, that means about light and, and the light that we see and use every day. So yeah, I'll talk about how we use the different kinds of radiation. And I will address the, the, the scary parts of radiation, the parts that we know are dangerous and um, how that relates to light and how we, how we think about light and radiation. Um, and then I'll talk a bit more about what scientists have learned from light and how we can use light. So let's dig into that radiation word a bit. Uh, so this might be a little bit of a stretch, I'm not a linguist, uh, but that radiation word kind of comes from this word radial, uh, which vaguely means in a circle or a sphere, just something, something that's round uh, that looks the same in all directions. So if you're standing at that center point that I drew in those circles and you looked all around all angles, uh, you would see the same thing. And that's called radial symmetry. Um, so that's a term that we use a lot to describe things in, in physics or math, uh, when you can stand at one point, look all around and, and you see the, the same stuff. Um, so to radiate, uh, again, where that word radiation comes from just means to start at that center point um, and then spread out. Uh, I just drew concentric circles as an example, um, but the radiate part is the starting from that point and then spreading out in a circular pattern so that it's the same at all distances from the center. So an example of this actually um, is those, those neat Bluetooth speakers uh, that, that, that can emit sound in all directions, like the ones that are kind of like cylindrical shape. I think they're like called like Beats Pills or something. Um, and so they, they emit sound in all directions. Um, and so if someone is standing five feet away on one side, five feet away on the other side, or anywhere on that circle I drew that's five feet away, they should hear the, the same level of sound because the sound is radiating from that speaker the same in all circular directions. Another way to visualize this is like when you drop a pebble or, or another drop of water, you're skipping rocks in, in like a lake and you see circles form uh, spreading out like ripples in the water from that point where, where you dropped your rock or your pebble or whatever else you dropped in the, in the water. Um, and so as you start at that center point and move out, if you look at this snapshot, you'll see that there's high and low points in the water. Um, and this shape is a wave shape. So these, these ripples that are forming concentric circles, circles within each other uh, from that center point are forming a, a wave shape. And so there's a direction of that wave and that wave again from radiation is starting from that center point and radiating uh, outwards, spreading and spreading in an, in an equal circular pattern. Uh, so that's a little bit where that radiate word comes from, but what about the electromagnetic part? Because that's also a, a concern point for people is that electricity, magnetism, you know, that's all like techie stuff. Um, 
So what's going on here? Um, so bear with me. This is the, the heaviest physics content slide, but that I, I hope that I have uh, some good examples uh, to, to kind of demonstrate what, what all these fields and electric and magno um, and waves are in this case. Uh, so the, the things that create electric fields are uh, charged particles, electrons, protons, the stuff that make up atoms or atoms that are not neutrally charged anymore, just basically anything that has a charge on it. Um, so an example of an electric field or like a, a static electricity, um, when you have the, that balloon and then you rub it on your hair, um, you're transferring electrons from, from one thing to, to the other one because they start off neutral. They're not attracted to each other or anything. But then once you're like rubbing the, the balloon on your head, uh, then there's a transfer of electrons. And so one of them has more electrons and then one of them has fewer electrons. Um, and so one of those things uh, is more charged up than the other. And so as you pull that balloon from your head, the, the hair is attracted to it. Um, and that's because of a static electric field um, that's coming from those charges. And it's static electricity because those charges aren't, uh, aren't a current, basically. Um, so yeah, static charges, not moving charges, create uh, static electric fields that, that aren't moving, but cause things to, to be attracted to them. And so as I mentioned, currents are moving charges. Um, and so we see that moving charges create this other kind of field called a magnetic field. Uh, now I know what you're thinking, this is not exactly like a, a refrigerator magnet um, or any kind of magnet that you stick together and then they stay stuck or you like put things on the fridge. Um, <clears throat> but this is what's called an electromagnet. Uh, so a way to visualize this field is um, I have a, a GIF here of a wire being attached to a battery uh, to create a current and there's a compass under it. And we know that compasses measure, uh, or at least they, they operate based on magnetic fields uh, because they, they use the magnetic field of the earth to point us towards the, the North Pole. Um, and so, yeah, typically they'll point towards North, but as you can see under that wire, uh, that, that compass needle is switching directions because it's lining up with the magnetic field that is now produced uh, from those charges moving around the wire um, and creating a current. So this makes me kind of impractical and why would we need to use magnets for this or a magnetic field? Um, but this is actually the principle behind how those really big cranes in uh, junkyards work. So that the piece on top, the, the big round piece that's attached to the crane, it's got tons and tons of loops of wires. Um, and so it's got really high currents going through it and it creates a very strong magnetic field to pick up um, magnetic things or metal things in, in the junkyard. And so we can see that static charges on the left here, yeah, create static electric fields that point in one direction. For the electron case, I have the arrows pointing towards it because it causes opposite charge things to, to point towards it. Um, and for the magnetic fields, uh, moving electric charges create this magnetic field that points in a different direction than the electric field did. Um, so from this, we see that moving electric fields, because when the charges are stationary, the fields aren't moving, they create magnetic fields. So moving electric fields create magnetic fields. But then we have this case where if the, the current um, of those charges, the, the way that they're moving, if that changes, so if they speed up, so if they change their velocity, like when you accelerate your car, you're changing your car's velocity. So if we do that to the electrons or if they change the direction that they're moving in, so if they're constantly switching back and forth between going one direction, going in another, they have to stop at the turnaround point. So their velocity is constantly changing or their speed is changing. Um, then, that then that magnetic field is gonna change and someone else did the math for it and showed us that that will also induce an electric field. So just to summarize, moving electric fields create magnetic fields and changing electric or changing magnetic fields create electric fields. And so if you've got a, a charge that's constantly moving like that, um, like that vibrating case where it's constantly switching direction and moving around a lot, um, then those things are gonna constantly change with each other. Uh, and that is what we see uh, when we see electromagnetic waves. So we have a charge that is vibrating, constantly changing its direction. And so the fields are constantly switching between the maximum electric field and the ma maximum magnetic field and they're feeding into each other. 
uh, to create this electromagnetic wave. Um, so that is the wave shape that I showed you uh, with the ripples in the water. Uh, so a good way to visualize how the, where, where the fields actually are, um, the things that, that cause the, um, the other stuff to react to the, to the fields, like, like the balloon and the hair, um, is that the field lines, as we call them, are actually inside of the wave. Um, and so we have the, these fields that are waving, um, but they are transporting energy because the electric fields, we know the electric fields uh, contain energy because they can move stuff when, when there's stuff in it, they attract things. And same with the magnetic fields, like with the, in the case of the compass, you know, the magnetic field made the compass needle move and align with it. Um, and so we have these fields that are waving and they are transporting energy. And so the alignment of these fields is something that's called the polarization. Um, and this is actually why uh, we have polarized glasses, uh, because as light has, has these fields, um, when it comes from the sun, it's not exactly all aligned. And when it bounces off of things, the directions of those field lines are going to change too. And so these polarized glasses or polarized sunglasses can help block uh, certain field lines. Uh, so, so polarized sunglasses uh, can be in a certain direction. The, the stuff, the glass or the plastic that's in them uh, will only respond to certain directions of the fields. Uh, so if we've got, let's say our plastic is aligned, so light this direction comes in, it's like, okay, you can go. And then when the light reflects, it comes in this way. And then the polarized glasses are like, nope, can't do it. You can't go through, sorry. And so it cuts off um, those, uh, those polarizations of light. And so that helps reduce the intensity of light you see, particularly when it's uh, very sunny out and you're near things that reflect a lot of light, like water or snow. That's particularly why ski goggles are great when they're, when they're polarized um, or sunglasses when you're out on the water. Um, because those reflect light and throw it in all kinds of directions, but polarized sunglasses can, can block that for you, um, you know, to, to help your eyeballs a little bit. Um, but of course, this is not actually what we see when we see light. Um, so we, what we see is we have that starting point and then the light spreads out in all directions. It radiates, it radiates the same in all directions. So you don't just see like one, one wave somewhere. Um, you see this glow in the spread um, because the light is, is radiating out in, a, in an equal sphere in all directions in this case. So before we start talking about color, because I've just been talking uh, very um, generally about electromagnetic radiation, I wanted to uh, talk about some terminology that I'll be using, introduce some, some characters in, in the story about light. Um, so Something that you might have heard of when talking about colors is the wavelength. So if we take that snapshot, that picture of ripples in the water, uh, and we measure the distance between the peaks, or if we look at the snapshot of the wave on the left, um, the distance between the peaks is called the wavelength. Um, and so that, that determines the color. Um, a word that I use more in my vocabulary as a scientist that study light, that study light is frequency. Um, so this is less like a picture of the, the wave or the light or the water um, and more if you're a person like at the beach standing in front of the water, of course, this is not, not to scale if the waves were that big and you were that small, you might have problems. But if the wave was coming at you um, and it was in the, this wave shape, then if you counted every time the peak reached you in one time interval, so we'll say like one second, and if you said peak every time there was a peak and you counted it, um, that would be what's called the, the frequency. Um, so the frequency of light is how many times you hear, you see that peak value um, in, in one second. Uh, so for light, um, this can be determined by the, the rate of vibration. That's one of the things that influences uh, the, the, the frequency of the light that we're seeing. So how many times we see a peak in one second. Uh, so if we have our, our particle, our electron, our charged particle, whatever, um, vibrating with a certain rate, um, then that's gonna influence the, the frequency, the amount of times we hit that maximum value. And because that tells you how many times it's gonna you know, switch between the electric and magnetic fields uh, in one second. And the unit we use for that is Hertz and the abbreviation is HZ. So you might see, see that word Hertz or um, the HZ around this talk. 
So to relate the wavelength and the frequency, I found this really cute GIF um, that shows that they basically tell you the same information. Um, so a, wave, a, a color of light has a wavelength and a frequency that are related by the speed uh, that the light radiates out. Uh, so the speed of light is like a cosmic speed limit. It is set for all the electromagnetic waves, for all light. Um, and so the thing that distinguishes the different colors um, is, is this wavelength or this frequency. Um, so for example, for red, um, that has a bit of a longer wavelength, or in this case, it has longer legs. Um, so it has to take fewer steps per second uh, to keep up with the speed of light. Whereas the little blue guy down there, bless his heart, he's just, he doesn't really have legs, he's just kind of bouncing. Um, but he, so he, he's got way shorter legs. Um, and so he has to take much, much smaller steps uh, or yeah, he, ha he has to take much smaller steps because his legs are so short, but he has to take more steps in the same amount of time to keep up with, with the red guy there. Um, so an example of this is if you have one, one of those little dogs, I guess this is true for any dogs, but I like thinking about the little dogs, it's like the little legs. Uh, they have to move their legs so many times uh, in the same amount of time that you take one step in order for you to keep up with each other uh, and travel at the same speed. So now that we know a little bit about how color and frequency are related and how all light travels at the speed of light because of those fields that we have, um, we can take a look at this electromagnetic spectrum. So this is, this is, okay, I hate to say this, sorry if anyone's a chemist, but this is like for me, the periodic table of, of light, um, like for, for light, because all light is described by, by this picture, kind of like with the periodic table, how all elements are just on, on that table. Um, and so we can see that the distinction between the lights is just the, the wavelength or frequency range. Um, so they're all made of the same stuff. They're all made of electromagnetic waves. Um, they all travel at the same speed. Um, and so the thing that's different is, is this wavelength or this frequency. So if they're all made of the same stuff, what makes visible light so, so special? Why is that the only light we can see? And it's such a small range, look at that they had to zoom in um, and spread it out for us to actually see, see the colors. Um, well, the only distinction there is that's just what our eyeballs can do. That's just what they can see. So we have uh, these cone cells that we, we were evolved to just see the, what I think is the most abundant light from the sun, maybe. If someone knows better, they can say in the chat. Um, but I'm pretty sure that was just the light that could reflect off of things and could help us process the, the world that we live in. And so our eyeballs evolved and could process those colors. Um, and not all the other colors. Um, so our, yeah, the, the cells in our eyes can only uh, respond to, to those colors. So a great way to visualize that is uh, the, the spectrum. I know some of you are thinking, oh, that's, that's the Pink Floyd thing uh, because of this. Uh, so when light is all mixed together, it's all the white light. That's why the light uh, from the sun looks white or from lamps looks white or, or yellow-ish, but mostly white. Um, and so when, when you have that, that light with all the colors mixed up, once that hits um, a different material, those lights are gonna bend uh, differently, those different colors um, because of that wavelength, because of how the material in there is responding to the different wavelengths. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, again, they're all made of fields. They're all made of electromagnetic fields, um, but the different wavelengths are hitting their, their maximum values differently. Um, at different intervals of time. So the, the, shorter, um, the shorter wavelengths are hitting their maximum values more. Um, and so they're hitting the stuff in the atoms a, a bit harder. <laughs> and so it's harder for them uh, to travel through. And so they, they bend more because they've been uh, slowed down a bit. Um, but then the, the longer wavelengths, that, that red light um, hits its maximum value less frequently because it has a lower frequency. Um, and so it hits the stuff in the material a bit less frequently. Um, and so it doesn't get, get knocked around and slowed down as much. Um, and so that causes a spread um, in, in that prism, which causes the rainbow. Um, and yes, this actually, this describes exactly how we see rainbows. So instead of the glass prism, it's the, the raindrops in the sky because rainbows, uh, water droplets are, are a different material than, than the air that, that light um, typically travels through. Um, and so the, the light from the sun uh, refract, it's called refracting or bending, bending through the water droplets 
uh, spreads spreads the rainbow out like that, and so we can visualize the the spectrum like that. So as I mentioned, the the, the material causes the light to bend because it's responding to the different wavelengths differently. Um, and so that's because the different colors of light, the different wavelengths of light have a different amount of energy in them. So on this far right side, that is the, the lowest energy because it's the longest wavelength or the lowest frequency. And so it's hitting that maximum value of, of its fields uh, less frequently. Whereas on the far side, on the far left side, um, those shorter wavelengths or those higher frequencies are hitting their maximum value uh, much more frequently. And so they are carrying more energy uh, in them. So we can think about a lot of things when um, relating color to energy. So we know that the longer wavelengths have less energy uh, that they transport. And then the, these higher frequencies, these shorter wavelengths on the left side carry more energy. Um, so as we think about that, let's go a little bit through how, how that um, color energy relation uh, impacts how we use light or how we can use the different kinds of light. So as I mentioned, the gamma rays are kind of the more dangerous thing. Uh, those are the ones actually that are the byproduct of nuclear uh, reactions. And so this is the, the highest energy zone of the electromagnetic spectrum because it's got those shorter wavelengths. And so gamma rays are actually so high energy that um, they can knock electrons out of, out of atoms and it, they change up their structure and that's what makes the, them unstable and why gamma rays are a little bit more dangerous. Um, X-rays are high enough energy that they can go through our bodies, um, you know, obviously less, less energetic than, than gamma rays, um, but, you know, still energetic enough that for whatever areas you're not getting an X-ray, that's why you put on the, the lead smock thing. Um, to block the rest of your body uh, because the, the x-rays can, can get through your body wherever they're not blocked. Uh, so also thinking about other things that are high energy uh, is this ultraviolet light. So as I mentioned, the blue light has been the hot topic. And actually I will say my glasses are blue light filtering. So I totally get it because you can get headaches. Um, well, I get headaches from, from looking at the screens all day. You know, that's not true for everyone, but I'm sure everyone has heard of the the dangers of being exposed to UV light for too long, particularly in tanning beds um, or not wearing sunscreen and getting sunburned because UV light is higher energy uh, than just the, the general visible light from the sun. And so actually since UV light is higher energy than visible light, even when it's cloudy, uh, the UV light can get through the clouds. Um, and so that's why you should, you're still recommended to wear sunscreen when it's cloudy. You probably can't get a sunburn as, as extreme as the one in this picture, um, but it is recommended that you do wear uh, sunscreen even when it's cloudy uh, because UV rays can still get through the clouds. Um, and similarly with solar panels, I know a common, common critique of solar panels is why this is such a waste. It gets cloudy. If it's cloudy, then, then that's wasteful and then we're not getting any energy from the sun but uh, the UV light is higher energy. And so it still works to, to store energy in the, in the solar panels, uh, even when it's cloudy, because that UV light can get through the clouds. So thinking a little bit more about the, the visible light um, and thinking about energy in relation to light that we can see, or I guess can't see. Um, so as I mentioned with, the, with those heat maps um, that, uh, that living things uh, radiate infrared light. Uh, so why does that happen? What does that mean? So everything in our bodies is, is always moving. That's what it means to have temperature, is to have some form of energy. And so uh, in this case, I'm using the model of uh, vibrating atoms are, are what's causing our temperatures to be a, a certain number um, because that's the energy that we have. And so the, the molecules that make up living things are, are vibrating at what we call infrared frequencies and I'm calling them infrared frequencies because they emit infrared light, because they are the, those vibrating um, atoms that are creating electromagnetic fields. Um, they, they are just infrared, uh, infrared uh, waves. And so we can take this picture a step further. And when you give something more energy and you heat it up more, you expect that they will vibrate even faster. Um, so they will vibrate with a higher frequency. Uh, they will go back, back and forth more times in one second. Um, and so infrared was a lower frequency and visible light was, was higher than infrared, of course, lower than, than the blue light. 
But as you go from the infrared higher and higher frequency, you get into that, um, that red and orange and yellow range. And so that's why things that are super, super hot, they, they have a lot of energy. And so they are vibrating at frequencies that are closer to, to the visible light range. And so that's why you can see certain things that, that are glowing because they're so hot. So getting into a little bit more this lower energy um, section of the spectrum. Uh, so infrared light is low enough energy. Everybody is, is emitting infrared light at all times. Um, and so we have this microwaves range and this radio waves range. Um, and as I mentioned, radio waves, um, we don't usually call them light, um, but the, the, for the sake of what I'm talking about, they are light because they are electromagnetic radiation, although it is uncommon to call them light. Um, they, they're made of the same stuff. They are electromagnetic waves and uh, they are very long wavelengths. And so radio and TV and Wi-Fi and 4G, 5G, um, they're all these lower energy, longer wavelength um, types of light. Um, and so these are particularly useful, these longer wavelengths, um, because radio signals in particular, um, or I guess any of those signals I just mentioned, they have to travel pretty far distances. Um, so those radio waves are like meters long, um, which is like, you know, distances between large things. Uh, and so they can travel further distances without getting distorted because they're lower energy, longer wavelength. And so they interact with stuff less frequently because they have lower frequencies. And also this long wavelength is particularly useful because you can store higher frequency information in them. Um, so this is actually where the, the information is, is stored is in that, that higher frequency. So that's how you, you tune into a certain uh, station and then the information is inside of the wave. Um, because those wavelengths are, are so long. So for AM radio, um, that just stands for amplitude modulation. So the amplitude is what's uh, waving with that radio frequency, even though the information is um, higher frequency. And then for FM radio, um, it's the, the frequency of the sounds you're listening to that is uh, changing with that, with that radio frequency. And so, as I did mention, uh, I did skip over the microwave range because I know that's another word that can kind of cause some reactions because we have microwave ovens in our houses. And I know, um, you know, you, you hear all the time, like, don't stand right next to the microwave. There's radiation coming from it, which is like true. There's literally, you know, there's electromagnetic radiation in, um, in that microwave. Um, but the reason why they're dangerous is super specific. Uh, so microwave ovens operate at a very specific frequency. Um, so they, the, the electromagnetic waves in the microwave are 2.45 gigahertz, um, which means nothing, except that that is the frequency that water molecules really like to vibrate at. And when they're given a push, like from the electromagnetic waves, um, they'll vibrate more. Um, so in this uh, Simpsons example, I have the swings. Uh, in this case, uh, Lisa, I hope that's her name, is the, um, is the water molecules in the food or the drink that you're trying to heat up. Um, and they like to, she likes to swing at a certain frequency and Homer is like the electromagnetic wave giving her push, um, helping her vi uh, not vibrate, she's swinging. Um, she's not vibrating more and more. And then he could do that and, and push her uh, faster and faster so that her frequency was higher. Uh, just like with, with the microwave ovens. Um, and the reason why that's dangerous for humans is because we are mostly water. So if, if this is the frequency that water likes to vibrate at to heat up your food, um, it could do the same to humans. But again, that's a very concentrated box. And inside that microwave box, um, there's panels that, that help the radiation in there um, get reflected back and forth and back and forth and add up um, so that they're super strong. And as you get further away from that microwave, uh, they are trailing off a bit. Uh, so once you're outside that microwave and you know a few feet away, uh, it's pretty pretty negligible. Um, and again, it's only that specific frequency of, of microwaves um, that is a cause for concern. Otherwise, um, microwaves are you know the the Wi-Fi and the 4G and the 5G, um, and that has nothing to do with vibrating humans. <laughs> so so I hope that can ease some minds a little bit. Um, but thinking a little bit more about how we use light and technology. Um, so this is more like back to the visible light. 
Uh, so we know that we can take in light and, and take pictures, um, or I guess cameras take in light. Um, and so kind of similar to eyeballs, there's like photoreceptors, but instead of photoreceptors, they're like digital uh, receptors. And they can turn visible light um, that's reflecting off of an object into a digital signal. And similarly, I mentioned solar panels um, and they're a form of alternative energy that takes in sunlight and converts it to electricity as well. Um, so this kind of gets to the question of how does light even become electricity? Um, so we'll, we'll think a little bit about that and hopefully I can uh, answer that question. So this is built off of a principle called the photoelectric effect, um, which to be straightforward, photo is light, electric is electricity. Um, and so this is light and electricity together. So the photoelectric effect uh, describes how light becomes electricity. Um, so I won't dig into the exact mechanics of what happens to the atoms in the, in the metal, um, but I will show you how scientists came to that conclusion, this photoelectric effect converting light into electricity. Um, so a guy many years ago, I think in the mid 1800s, um, he first uh, did this experiment um, because they had two wires and they had a current going through them and they put them real close and they, they spark because um, you have electrons going through. Um, when he shined light on it, and that actually changed the voltage at which the, 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 it would spark. Uh, so there's some relationship between light and electricity. So they weren't really sure about what was going on and how that was happening and kind of unpredictable in the future if you don't have a model for that. So something that a lot of scientists will do um, is they will change lots of pieces of their experiment to try to build a model uh, that will make it predictable in the future. Like it is now for, we can predict how efficient solar panels are or um, like what colors of light you're taking in in your camera. Um, so a really crude model of this experiment is a flashlight and uh, a piece of metal. Um, and we, we use metal a lot in electronics because um, it allows for electrons to flow through it so freely. Um, so what a scientist saw was he shined light on metal and then ping, we got electrons coming out. Uh, so in the case of my, my model, my example I have here, um, We've got uh, three, you know, three electrons, uh, not realistic, obviously, uh, that, that came out, I would say at like a medium speed. Uh, so they shine light of a certain um, color and a certain uh, intensity at the metal, see three electrons come out. So as I mentioned, to try to build a model, um, they changed uh, some of the different factors of this experiment. Um, so next they want to see how to increase the, the energy of, of these electrons that we're leaving. So one of the forms of energy that we'll look at is something called kinetic energy, or as I like to call it the moving energy because it's how much energy something has while it's moving, um, or like you can relate it to, to the speed of something. And so what they did was they made the light brighter um, to see if that would increase the energy. And so what they actually saw happen was they, they just saw more electrons. Those electrons did not have a higher moving energy or kinetic energy even though we know that light is energy, so that you would think that more light, a higher brightness of light would mean a more energetic electrons moving faster. Um, but that was not the case. They just saw a higher number of electrons. So what, what they did to, to test this again was relate back to that color and energy principle and chose a higher energy of light. Um, so we know that blue light is one of the higher visible range lights. And so, they shine blue light onto this and they did see those electrons move faster. Um, so they had more moving energy. And this, uh, this solidifies that, that color and uh, energy relationship directly. Um, but also the big question mark that was around here was how does light relate to a number? How does brighter light uh, mean more electrons? Um, and so here's where things got, you know, a little controversial. So Albert Einstein proposed that light was a particle. Um, so this is the photon. This is the particle of light. Um, the photon is a quantum particle. Quantum just means something that's countable or quantifiable. Um, so he said that light was something that was quantifiable that you could count. Um, because when you have his, his idea was that when you have brighter light, that just means that you have more photons, you have a higher number of photons, and therefore that creates a higher number of electrons. 
so that is what he used to, to, to mathematically explain the photoelectric effect. Um, and so he built a model around this, this photon um, and, and this particle of light. And this is actually, oh, there it goes. I always forget it does that. <clears throat> Was he, this is what he won the Nobel Prize for. Um, none of that relativity business, um, but actually for using a photon, a particle of light to describe this photoelectric effect, which is how light creates electricity. And so a photon, it, it is a wave. Um, and so it's a wave that you can count. Um, as I mentioned, it's a quantum particle, which just means that's countable and quantifiable. Um, so photons, since photons are a wave, they have all of the same wave properties. So they have wavelength and frequencies. So they have this, all the same colors. Um, they have the polarization, the directions that I mentioned, the directions that the fields are pointing in and therefore what, um, what materials respond to. And they have the same energy again, as I mentioned, because they can have the colors and they can be visible, they can be invisible, they can be all the, or a combination of wavelengths and frequencies or just one color. Um, so what was really cool and what was really unique about this, um, this particle description of light uh, was that we could directly relate some of these things, as I mentioned, frequency to energy, and there's just one number between them. So we just, they're, they're directly related and you don't have to do any kind of weird math because when you think about light uh, as a wave, um, waves can be kind of scary for, for physicists and astronomers and mathematicians to work with um, because there's a bit more complicated math behind it. And so to, to get the energy out that you have to do a lot, a lot more math um, but with this particle case, uh, we say, okay, one, one blue photon has this, this one energy and that is exactly the energy. And if we want the intensity, we just multiply it by the number, the number of photons of that energy. And so another quantity um, that kind of came out of thinking of light as a particle uh, was, was this momentum wavelength relationship. So this momentum thing was really interesting um, because as we know, light is just, it's energy. It's not matter. It's not like a, it's not a, a thing that, that crashes into other things and makes the move. So momentum is uh, what explains how when you're playing pool and you shoot the, the cue ball and then it hits another ball and then the cue ball stops moving and then the other ball moves, um, that is a transfer of momentum. So that is a, a massive thing, massive just meaning it has mass, not that's really large. Um, that's this large thing that uh, crashes into another thing uh, and then it transfers its movement, its momentum to the other object. But as I mentioned, light does not have matter. It does not have mass. Um, it is just energy. It transfers energy and it makes other things respond to it. Um, but it, it can use momentum in a really similar way to, to a particle that has mass and is made of matter. Um, so this is one of the really cool things that has led to a lot of modern uh, science uh, exploration and discoveries. So how can we use photons in this way? Um, so one of the, the cool things that we can use, particularly photon momentum for, um, is we can use them to trap particles um, in, in lasers, basically. So this principle of optical tweezers uses two lasers that are shooting at each other. And so since the lasers are full of photons, um, the photons are gonna hit whatever object they're trying to trap and bounce off each other. Um, and so, so the forces from both sides um, are gonna, are gonna keep those, uh, whatever it's being trapped in that same place. So I found this really cool uh, GIF from San Francisco State University where they show uh, trapped glass beads. And so since those beads are trapped, they can move the optical tweezers around and actually kind of show them dancing a little bit. Uh, this is also used, optical tweezers are used to, to trap like the, the two sides of like DNA and they can test uh, different properties of DNA um, because they, you can't really use tweezers to pick them up, but you can use these optical tweezers to pick up DNA. Um, there's also a similar principle behind ion trapping, uh, which is again, shooting, shooting light in opposite directions so that it bounces off of each other and then putting an atom or an ion or a molecule in that, in that place. And so that the atom or the molecule does not move around anymore because it's being pushed from both directions uh, from light. And so this is a method to isolate one single system because atoms are also quantum systems. Um, 
and it's a potential way to uh, to store information for, for a quantum computer because you're keeping that atom in one place. Um, and so this has been really essential to the, to the advancements of uh, quantum computing and quantum information, uh, which is kind of like a hot thing right now, getting, getting a lot of money to, to advance how, how uh, computers work and how quantum computers can work. So this is getting a tiny bit into my research, um, but we can also use the photons themselves uh, to, to be put into quantum computers and quantum communications or quantum information. So as I mentioned with, with the sunglasses uh, and polarization, you can uh, determine pretty easily um, how to put a polarization on something, how to choose light of a certain polarization. Um, so as I mentioned with the, the glasses, it only lets through lights of certain polarizations. Um, and so we can create um, the like plates like that that are kind of like in the, in the glasses. Um, to, to switch up polarizations or choose specific polarizations. Um, so we're changing the directions of the field. Um, and so we can do that pretty accurately. And so we can store information that way. The information is the polarization, is the direction of the field in that case. Um, and also since light is still a wave, photons are still waves, um, they can, you can change the frequency and keep that polarization information because again, the polarization is just the direction of the field. And when you change the frequency, it doesn't change that polarization. Um, and so that's a little bit of the implications of what I work on, which again, I'll get to in a, in a tiny bit. Um, hopefully I have time for it. Uh, but if you can change the, the frequency of that light, you can change the color of the light and keep that polarization information. Um, then you have a neat uh, particle, the photon, that can communicate between all the other uh, types of quantum uh, computers. And it's important that the photon is one particle and that's not just, just light, um, like we use radio signals to mediate communication already, um, but it's important that it's a photon, that's one particle, because that's what it means for a quantum computer is that it is a, a quantifiable countable thing. And that's how the other information is stored um, in a quantum computer. So as I mentioned, light has been behind a lot of the greatest scientific discoveries um, and the advancements of lots of technologies already. Um, so some of these might be familiar to some of you, some of them might not, but I hope there's a little bit for everyone. Um, and a lot of these technologies have been uh, developed and a lot of these scientific discoveries have happened because of something I haven't really talked about yet right in the middle there, um, which is a laser. Um, so a laser the R stands for radiation, um, and lasers are just a concentrated piece of light um, focused down to one tiny point uh, instead of uh, spreading out in all circular directions, although it does still, still spread in a certain way. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how different scientific discoveries have been uh, found by light. Um, so that one on the top left right there is actually not related to physics or, or astronomy, um, but Rosalind Franklin used um, x-rays to discover the helical structure of um, DNA. So she was an x-ray crystallographer. That was her career was she used x-rays to identify not just the helical structure of DNA, um, but also the structures of viruses and coal. Um, and so how did this work? So she shot an x-ray beam, an x-ray like laser beam. And so x-rays are special because the, they have a shorter wavelength, the short, you know, right next to, to gamma rays. And the size of the X-ray is really close to the size of the distance between atoms in most solid things um, and also DNA things. Um, and so X-rays are particularly sensitive uh, to the atoms that make up stuff um, because they're, they're around the same size. And so when X-rays bounce off of individual atoms in a material, um, and the, the way that they bend or the way that they reflect, that can identify not just what's in the atom, but also, or what's in the material, but also where the things are located. Um, so X-ray crystallography is used now still to identify uh, crystals and structures and whatnot. So scientists also use lasers more in the visible range um, in a principle called fluorescence, where you put one color in, get a different color out. Um, to identify different structures or look at pictures of, in this case, this is um, neurons and, and glial cells um, from, from a group at the University of Oregon studying uh, retinal implants. 
Um, and so they use lasers to, to scan and, and look at uh, what they've grown to make sure that everything has grown okay and that they can identify the structures uh, that they've grown. Um, and so here's my little snippet of my research. So I use lasers and this principle of fluorescence um, to look at uh, things that might make a crystal different or defected. Um, so crystals are usually just a pattern of one or two or sometimes three, I guess, uh, types of atoms. So for example, a diamond is a, is a crystal. It's got a bunch of carbons in a specific pattern. Um, but sometimes there's something that's not carbon in, in the diamond. I don't use diamond, that's just an example. Um, and so light will respond differently in that place than it will in all the other places. So I've got my little laser here. It's important that it's green or it's just important that's one color. And then as I scan it across my material, I see light of a different color. Um, and it's important that it's that different color than green um, because that tells me I have a different thing in my crystal there going on. Um, and specifically, I look for single photons because as I mentioned earlier, my research is related a little bit to using photons as um, information carriers in quantum computers. So if we know exactly how to create single photons, um, then, then we can integrate them into devices like computer chips a little bit easier. Um, and so, so I use a laser to, to look at those things um, and it's giving me a different color uh, because there's something different happening with the energy in that crystal. So some of the energy is going into the crystal because there's something wrong with it and then it's giving me a different color out. And so that's how I can measure the, the defects in my crystal. Uh, so another way that scientists use light is they actually take a laser and they focus it into a two dimensional sheet. Um, so I think this is a really cool video that shows the, the fluorescence um, using this light sheet, it's called a laser sheet um, of the, the bacteria in, in the stomach of a zebrafish um, because zebrafish are what's called a model organism for, uh, for humans um, because they have really similar structures actually, even though they're just little fishes. Um, but this is really useful because if they can track um, the bacteria in, uh, in the stomach, uh, then they can figure out how they colonize, grow, interact, how they respond to antibiotics. So this is really useful for the medical pharmaceutical industry um, to develop antibiotics that, are, uh, that really are helpful to, to human uh, guts as well. So moving a little bit away from taking pictures of stuff, but getting into astronomy, which I definitely know less about. So if someone in the audience knows more about these things, I, I uh, highly recommend that you definitely say in the chat um, or, or correct me um, in any way, I don't mind. Um, but the gravitational wave observation actually used lasers. They didn't shoot lasers into space or anything to take pictures of the gravitational waves. They used lasers here on earth and they use something that's called an interferometer. Um, which uses the interference principle, which is, for example, when you're in the ocean and you have waves coming at you in two directions and then the waves suddenly collide, if they line up, if their peaks line up, then it just creates a bigger wave um, and that's a constructive interference. But if the waves are coming at you from different directions and their peaks aren't lining up, then they're gonna cancel out and you're gonna just get flat, flat water. Um, so the, the scientists at the Gravitational Wave Observatory um, they, had, they have to understand really precisely how light works, how sensitive this light has to be in order to detect gravitational waves. Um, because they want to be sensitive enough at a specific frequency that it can detect gravitational waves and that it's not gonna detect uh, someone bumping into something in the office or um, you know, so, uh, the, these are actually underground or something like driving over um, the, the laser beams. Uh, so they have to understand light pretty well as well. Uh, so not just the people that study light like me, but people that use light have to understand light. Um, and so they were able to tune this to a very specific frequency. Um, they, they got the light super precise. And so these two different observatories um, in two different locations were able to see the exact same shift um, because of this interference effect. Um, and so that's how they were able to determine that there were gravitational waves that they observed. And so another cool thing about light and electromagnetic radiation that came out of these observations was gamma ray bursts. So I haven't really talked about gamma rays a lot because I don't know a lot about them. Uh, but I thought that this was a very cool observation that came out of the gravitational wave um, observation uh, because that helped uh, scientists point their telescopes to, to the, the event um, that was creating the, the gravitational waves um, 
And so these gamma ray bursts, the light that came from, from this event um, could tell them a little bit more about what's going on in there, what could create uh, gamma rays like that. Um, and so these scientists also have to understand the different information that they're getting from their different telescopes. Um, so they have a telescope in space that's gonna detect light differently than the telescope that's on earth. Because as I mentioned, stuff on earth has to go through the atmosphere, it has to go through clouds and stuff. Um, and so there's gonna be different things going on there. So they have to understand um, what's different about their light and how light is reacting to different things around it. Uh, so I think this is always a great picture to end on uh, because it really shows the range of things that we can see with all the different energy bands of light. Um, so again, I don't know much about these pictures, but I think they're really excellent uh, because they show you uh, how light, how different kinds of light um, can look at the same thing and see something completely different. Um, and so astronomers can learn a lot about the different things in the universe. Um, and since light arrives to us at a finite speed, they're still getting information from the very dawns of time um, from, from when everything was created. And so since, since matter uh, interacts with light differently, um, by measuring different kinds of light from different places, they can learn a little bit more about what's out there, what kinds of atoms, molecules, gases, structures are out there. Um, and yeah, they can learn about how that stuff was created, when that stuff was created. Um, and, and so there are, there are scientists that can use light to answer the, the big questions in the universe. Um, and that's one of the things that I appreciate so much about light um, is that yes, I'm, a, I'm someone that does optics, I study light, um, but all kinds of scientists have to study and understand light um, and use light in really unique ways. Um, but it's one, light is one of those things that unifies um, all kinds of scientists um, and doesn't just like answer uh, questions about light or how we see or just take pictures of things, um, but also you know transports information like with the cell phones, um, radios, and and Wi-Fi and whatnot. Um, it also you know it can help improve our quality of light, like with the medical research um, that gets done by by using light. Um, and also, as I mentioned, it, it can answer those fundamental questions about where we came from and where the stuff we're made of came from, and and it can improve those technologies I was talking about, like make that, that light chip in your cell phone. Um, so I really appreciate the chance to talk to you all about this topic that I care a lot about and have really grown to appreciate over my time in graduate school. Uh, so yeah, I thank you for your time and thank you for, for sticking around and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, so I definitely wrote down a few questions because this has been really interesting and really enjoyable. Um, and I welcome anyone in the chat to bring up some questions if you have any. Um, I wrote like a, a range of them down from where like they came up in my brain. Um, so one of the ones that I was curious about, um, so, so you talked about like optical tweezers and like trapping with like lasers. And it seemed like in the pictures there was like two lasers like pointing at each other, like trapping like little atoms. Um, but it makes me think of like, if I tried to like hold marbles in like two directions, like wouldn't it like pop out in one of the other ways? So like, why don't you have to use lasers like all around to trap it like from all directions? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I think one of the things is that atoms are much, much smaller than laser spot sizes. Um, so it would be more like if you had your hands <laughs> clasping it, but also um, because the, the forces are, uh, so we've got, forces from the, the light, I don't really know how to do this, uh, like pointing in all kinds of directions, not just straight up and down, um, but since the, it's called like the beam waist of the, the laser um, is rounder um, or slightly bigger than the, than the atom. Um, it's also got forces pointing in those directions and then same deal down like that. And so those horizontal forces will cancel each other out um, because it's from both sides, it's pointing in like all kinds of directions. And then the only forces left are the ones that are gonna uh, trap it vertically, or I guess in, in the ion trap horizontally. Mm -hmm. All right, that definitely makes sense. I think I was just imagining it like tiny lasers, like my fingers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question in the chat. Um, what comes after radio waves or gamma waves in like their respective directions at the ends of the spectrum? That's a great question. Let me go back to the spectrum. I don't, I, I think those are the, okay, this is difficult. Let me just, oh, here it is. Okay. Um, I don't know that those types of things have been measured. Um, 
I think that radio waves, like that's the, the largest category for sure. Um, I think that's just a general term for the longest wavelengths of things. Um, and gamma rays is now just a general term for the shortest wavelengths of things. So if there were um, lights of lower uh, frequency or higher frequency that were measured, I think they would probably just be put into those same categories. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure that it, it would be anything uh, a, with a different name. Mm. Yeah, maybe in some sci-fi or something, there's like fancy new names for them. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, it's sort of on the topic of like, uh, like, like gamma X-ray ultraviolet. Um, so you talked about like having to wear sunscreen on like cloudy days. Do you also have to wear sunscreen when you're just like indoors? That's a really great question. I feel like I've heard of this before because I know, okay. So, so this is like from personal experience, like driving for a long time and the, like the sun is coming in the window. Um, I don't know, I feel like the sun weakens enough when it's coming through windows, like the UV light, um, because it's not as high energetically as, um, yeah, those X-rays and, um, and the gamma rays. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, like lead will stop X-rays. Um, so I think that since UV light is less, is less energetic, it has a harder time getting through the glass, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the specifics of that, but I, I think it weakens and, and like disperses enough because it bends a lot more um, when it passes through, through glass. Great, thanks. Um, okay, uh, another question I had. Um, so, you, so you mentioned um, like LIGO and interferometry and things like that. Um, so as an astronomer, I mostly know about interferometry through gravitational wave detection. Um, I'm, is this also, it's got lasers in it. So is this also used um, in like uh, physics with optics? Yeah, sorry, I'm like trying to get to it. Um, yeah, absolutely. It is used all the time. Um, yeah, so this interference principle is really useful um, for, for, I mean, in my field, at least for measuring uh, materials and things. Um, so actually one of my lab mates, uh, she studies uh, like trampolines in the materials. And so since trampolines are constantly moving, um, she's got one laser that stays the same and then one laser that's shooting at the, at the trampoline. And so as that moves back and forth, where, where those waves are in that second, um, in that second uh, laser arm, it's called an arm, <laughs> uh, will, will change. And so she can track the exact motion um, because it's causing the, the, um, the wave and the laser to move. Um, I know interferometers are used in a lot more places and I, it's just escaping me right now, but yeah, they're very common mm -hmm. um, in, in research. Wow, oh, it's, it's funny to think of like things on an optics table being called trampolines. <laughs> but I guess we have like balloons and things that do like astronomical detection. So a lot of fun words. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, if there aren't any other questions in the chat, I'll ask one more and then maybe wrap up. So if you do have any questions you are definitely wanting to ask Rachel, feel free to do that right now. Um, so my last question, um, which is maybe a little bit more personal, wh what has been maybe the weirdest or most interesting thing that you've experienced like about light, well, in, in your research or in like your daily life or anything like that? Well, wow, that's a really great question. The weirdest thing. Okay, this might this might expose me a little bit. It's not as <laughs> weird, but I was um, and and this is maybe why I ended up getting the blue light glasses. Um, so we use in my lab we use a lot of um different kinds of light sources. Um, because I when I look at my samples, I look for specific colors, and um, I use a technique called spectroscopy, um, which helps me measure um different wavelengths of light at the same time, uh, to see how much of each color there is, um. And so I was uh, fixing up this uh, spectrometer that we inherited um, and I was using uh, a helium lamp, I think. I, it was one of those blue lamps was, um, and, and they're very blue and they're very intense because they are used to, to calibrate um, or to set specific locations. Um, and I was like, this is fine. Like I don't need special glasses, special goggles for this. And I very much had a headache for a week afterwards. Um, so, you know, you can know the math and the reasons for things all you want, but I think, you know, experiencing it um, is helpful for, <laughs> uh, for helping, uh, you know, really understand like, oh yeah, the high energy is bad for my eyeballs, wow. Um, yeah, as far as my like specific research goes, um, 
sorry, now I'm like elaborating on your question more. <laughs> um, I think it's been really cool, um, like understanding where photons, I kind of had a crisis about it for a little bit um, because it is mostly a mathematical model. I was like, yeah, we're gonna see physically exactly why light is a particle and a wave. Um, and it turns out how it goes is like, we think about light as a wave and we do all the math about waves. And then one day it's like, okay, now we're gonna think of it like a particle. Um, and then that's about how it goes. Uh, but measuring, actually measuring photons. So a lot of my research is counting photons to make sure that I am actually producing uh, one photon at a time. Where did it go? No, oh, it was up here. Um, oh yeah, there it is, there it is, okay. Um, and so I spend a lot of time just like counting photons, but I've also learned a lot um, about, about light and about photons that way. Cool. Um, we do have another question in the chat. Um, do you know how radios um, convert radio waves into sound? Um, so that uses something that's called a transducer. And I think transducer is just a general term for anything that converts one type of energy to another type of energy. Um, so a transducer, I think in this case, would take in the light um, and then it would make it into sound waves. So I really wish I knew how sound waves are created, but it's, uh, so sound waves are like compressions of, of air around us. And then, you know, our ears respond to, to how the air is compressed or, or extended or whatever um, in different patterns. Um, so I bet there's something in your radio that once it gets light, once it gets the energy from light and that frequency, it's like, okay, I'm gonna move this thing or not move this thing, this amount um, based on that light. Um, and so it's gonna compress or not compress the air by certain amounts. I think someone else might know more than me about that. <laughs> that makes sense, but I'm, I also am an astronomer, so I don't do a lot of sound things. Um, <laughs> well, great, I think. Yeah, I think that's most all the questions um, and I'm finished with my questions. So I just want to say thank you again. And thank you from uh, Astronomy on Tap, Champaign Urbana. We haven't, I think, had any of like visiting speakers, at least since I've been here. Um, and so COVID is challenging for us in a lot of ways, but it is nice that we're able to have people um, from different places come and give talks and uh, just pay some attention to our little department in um, Champaign Urbana. So, yeah, well, thank you so much for inviting me and having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. And have a good night, everybody. Make sure to drink your astronomy on top drinks and hope for some light tomorrow. <laughs> Bye.